And so today, I want to talk about what it looks like for us to make disciples. Because why are we here? We're here to make disciples. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, to make disciples. To make disciples. You see, to make disciples is a critical part of our Christian faith. Someone once said this, making disciples when done right leads to the transformation of lives. Transform lives in turn, transform communities, culture, and countries. You see, this is the reason why discipleship is so important because discipleship is the vehicle through which God brings about the redemption of the world. Right? Because if we make disciples the right way, if we make the disciples in the way that God had intended for it to happen, it will ultimately lead to transformation, the transformation of lives, the lives that are being discipled. And those lives will in turn transform communities, culture, and countries. It is the key to the transformation of society. It's the key to the transformation of the world. And if you think about it today, you look at the world that we live in, it is in deep need of transformation. There is so much chaos going around. There's so much um, misleading things that are out there that are drawing us away, that are vying for our attention. And there is a need for transformation. The very fact that there are people in this world who are still dying of hunger and thirst is evidence of this fact that this world needs to be transformed by the glory and the goodness of God. But that can only take place if true discipleship happens. Now, why, or how can we be so confident to say that the reason why we're here is to make disciples? It's because it comes out of the mouth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, straight off the bat. If you go to your Bibles in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, one of the things that Jesus says after he is resurrected is all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Will you join me as we commit this time to the Lord together in prayer? Father, as we dive into your word, as we seek to answer this question, why are we here? God, I pray that you will show us what it looks like to make disciples. But we won't just know what it looks like. We'll be stirred within our hearts to live it out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You see, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey or observe all that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We know this familiar passage as the Great Commission. You've heard, probably heard of speakers and pastors talk about how, while this is the great commission that has been given to us, it is the great omission that the church has forgotten about. Or maybe we know of, but we're not really fully participating in it. But what I want to draw to us here is I want us to recognize this truth. We are all called to make disciples of all nations. In fact, to make disciples of all nations is the goal. It's not just to see them come to know Jesus. And we have to understand this because there are times in our lives where we're so drawn to this pool of wanting to see people saved, wanting to see people come to the place of salvation. And that's a good thing, but that's not the end goal. Salvation itself is not the end. Discipleship is the end. Being made more and more like Christ, being who He has called us to be, being like Jesus and doing what He has called us to do, that is the end. It's more than just knowing about Him. It's more than just the gift of salvation. In fact, discipleship is the gift that salvation brings us into. See, evangelization isn't the end goal. Making disciples is. And this is where as a church, as Christians, we have to ask ourselves a very important question. How are we doing in this place of making disciples? In fact, if I could break that down for you, the question I will ask you is this, 
how many people have you discipled? In fact, can you come up with a list of names of the people that you have discipled? To bring that another step further, a more intimidating question, but yet a good reality check for us, is as you look at those names and you ask them, how many of those people on that list will identify you as discipling them? Have you been making disciples? Are you still making disciples? Because if this is one of the key reasons why we are here, why Jesus chose to leave us here on this earth, the question we must ask ourselves is, are we fulfilling the purpose and the mission He has for us? Are we making disciples? But in all honesty, when you talk about this question, we can have a range of answers. Some people will say yes, some people will say no. But a good number may even say, I don't know. Because this idea of making disciples is so abstract at times. We say, go forth and make disciples, and we go, yes, let's go make disciples, but we don't know what making disciples is. What does it look like to make disciples? Well, we look at the Bible. I mean, in no way, shape, or form is anybody here making disciples the way that Jesus did. How many of you have someone following you 24-7 for at least three years straight. The only time you don't see them, the only time they're not in your presence is when you're in the toilet, hopefully. That's what it looked like when it came to Jesus and his disciples. In fact, that's what it looked like during his time. Any time someone became a disciple, not just of a rabbi, but a disciple of a carpenter, a disciple of someone in the trade, they would follow them day in and day out. It's not often that we see that. So, then what can we glean from the Scriptures? What does it look like for us to make disciples? Because if this is what God is calling us to do, and we don't know how to live it out, it's almost like we're just hitting out in the dark and hoping that we've made a disciple in the time that we have here on earth. And so for the rest of our time together, I want to unpack what making a disciple looks like. I hope we don't need convincing that we need to make disciples. Oftentimes, we know it in our heads, but it's hard for us to really catch it with our hearts. And I'm going to leave that to the work of the Holy Spirit, because no matter what I say, it is the Holy Spirit that works upon the hearts of His people. But what I can do is I can kind of explain to us what making disciples looks like. And we see it even in the Scripture that we just read. In fact, Jesus breaks it down for us. How do we make disciples? Well, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And then he continues. He expounds on what it means to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And so two things that we're going to be unpacking today. What does it look like for us to make disciples? Well, number one, it's to baptize people. And number two, it's to teach them to observe all that Jesus has commanded. So what does it look like for us to baptize people? Now, I want you to hear this carefully. Traditionally, the person who baptizes people in church is the pastor. Biblically, all are called to baptize. In fact, there will come a time and a season in our church, I'm working on it, where the day will come where every single one of you will baptize somebody on Baptism Sunday. Can you imagine what this will look like? The, the joy and the wonder and the responsibility of parents baptizing their children, friends baptizing the friend that they brought to church, leaders baptizing members, but yet it's not just for leaders, it's for all. It's where we understand and we recognize that every single individual in the body of Christ is called to be a priest and called to priestly duties, then actually as a church, and I'll be the first to admit, I think we've fallen a little bit short. Where we've kind of relegated the practice of baptizing people to just a select few which seems weird if you think about it because we all recognize that the Great Commission is given to all believers. 
And I just want to leave that thought with you because I know if I were to come up and ask you, hey, would you like to baptize? Everybody will run away. Right? I'll, I'll be like the plague. Uh, and, and yet, it's something that I think we as a church need to wrestle with. We are all called to baptize them. It's actually part of what it means to make a disciple, to baptize them. But what does it mean to baptize them? Now, two things. Two things that this is speaking about, that Jesus is speaking about. Number one, it is the practice of baptism that we are all very familiar with. It's this place where we set aside a day or a time and someone comes in, they give a testimony, why they want to believe Jesus, why they want to follow him, and then we, they go into the water and then they are baptized. Now, here in our church, we practice the baptism by immersion. That means your entire body goes in and then it comes out. Now, there are occasions in our church where we do sprinkling or we pour water, uh, especially if the individual is a little bit sick, uh, unable to go through the waters all the way, um, different things like that. But I want to give us some understanding because we don't just want to do something for the sake of tradition. Why do we believe that to baptize somebody in the practice of it, it's by immersion? Well, it's because we see it throughout Scripture, right? We see it throughout Scripture first, in the example of Christ, in the book of John, uh, no, in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God come upon him. He saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove and alighting on him. Now, again, in the imagery and in the description that we see in the text, Jesus had to come out of the water. And so that's why we believe that it's this place of immersion. Now, we don't just see it here, but even in the days that would follow, the years that would follow after Jesus' death in Acts chapter 8, Verse 37 to 38, another example that we see of the early church, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, this is Philip and the eunuch, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? <clears throat> and Philip commanded, oh no, the man commanded the chariot to stop, <clears throat> and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Again, this idea of he went down into the water. Now, these are just examples that we see, physical examples, descriptions of what it looks like for people to get baptized. But you see, we're not just following it because that's what people did. It's not just a physical thing, a physical practice. It's a physical practice that has spiritual significance. We don't just do it for the sake of doing it. Why do we practice the place of baptism? We see this in Galatians chapter 6. No, it's chapter 3, verse 26 to 27. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God. Through faith, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Why do we get baptized? Why do we practice baptism? It's because it symbolizes a life of faith. Now hear me carefully. Water baptism is not a means to salvation. It is an expression of our salvation. It is this testimony that we have now put on Christ. What it doesn't mean is that if you've not been water baptized, you've not put on Christ. That's not what it means. It just means because I have put on Christ, I want it to be made known to the people. It's a covenant, it's a commitment, and we want to come into that. Now, we don't just see it in Galatians, but Paul speaks about this as well in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. Now, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It's, why, why is baptism so important? Why is it so significant? Why is the act of immersion significant? It's because it symbolizes a dying to self and a coming to life in Christ. Again, the key word here is it symbolizes. Why am I taking some time to talk about this today? Because I have found in the conversations with people that more often than not, Christians, especially those who are second, third, fourth generation Christians, don't have a very strong understanding of why water baptism is important. 
we treat it as tradition. We treat it as just going through the motion. In fact, what I found is typically non-Christians have a greater understanding of the significance of water baptism than Christians. See, for non-Christians, they're okay for their kids to go to church. They're okay for their kids to serve in church. But over my dead body, are you getting water baptized? It's okay for you to, to say the sinner's prayer, but you ain't getting baptized. Why? Because they understand something significant, that the moment that happens for them, it's the point of no return. Now again, that's not what we believe in our faith, but that's what it represents to the people around us. It is so significant. There is something special about water baptism. In fact, this was something I needed to learn growing up. I grew up in a Christian home. My, my mom is here, right? I, mean, we, we, I grew up in a Christian home. I delayed my water baptism for as long as I could because I was like, I'm saved. Right? My parents passed us. But that's what? Every, every, when I was young, my parents bathed me. Oh, I baptized already. Right? I mean, go in the water so many times, you know, die, 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 come on, come on. I mean, it's like, to me, it was just an act, right? Why, why do I want to do something like that if, if it's just like, it's just, it's, just, it's just an act with no significance? And then I came to read the scriptures. I came to understand that it was so much more. Yes, number one, it's a command that God gives and Jesus calls us to, so we should do it. But yet there was great spiritual significance and representation and symbolism, not just for the Christians, but actually for all those who witness the baptism. Do you hear what I'm saying? We're not just getting water baptized for us. It's not just to affirm something within us because we don't need that affirmation. The Spirit of God within us is enough. The grace of God in our lives is enough. But it is also for what it means and what it represents to people in our lives as they see us get water baptized. But it's not just a practice. You see, to make disciples, it's not just a practice of baptizing someone. It's not like, okay, then now everybody go home, then you just go find your family, and then dunk them in, and then come out and say a prayer. No, it's not just about that. It's not just about the practice. What I believe Jesus is speaking about here, because the Jews understood this clearly. The Jews live in a holistic culture. Everything is, it's all mashed in together. We follow more the Greeks, which is dichotomistic. We split everything into categories. That's not how Jesus operates. That's not how the gospel works. When he speaks about baptism, it's not just to baptize them in the practice of water baptism. It's to baptize them in our, our lifestyle is to baptize them with the lifestyle of, are you immersing them? Are you overwhelming them? You see, the word baptize in the Greek is the word baptizo. The word baptizo means to immerse, to overwhelm, to wash. And I love this because oftentimes when Christians read this passage, we read it as to baptize them, to overwhelm them, to immerse them, to, to wash them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we relegate it to just the practice of water baptism. Can I tell you, that's not all that Jesus was speaking of. What he meant was this, are you overwhelming them? with my presence? Are you overwhelming them with the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Not just in the practice of water baptism, but with every waking moment of your life. I want you to think about that. What use is water baptism if the moment they come up, they're no longer immersed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? See, to make disciples is more than just the practice of water baptism. To make disciples is what the practice actually represents, which is that we will live a life that interacts with them in such a way that they will always be immersed in the presence and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the question that I want to present to us this morning, why are we here? Are we actually immersing people in the presence of God? Because if you live a life that is always immersing them, that is always overwhelming them, I love the word overwhelm, because it means that no matter what they're going through, the presence and the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, whatever it represents, 
is greater than whatever they're going through. When you meet with people, when you interact with others, your colleagues, your, your family members, the people in church, are you overwhelming them with the presence of God? Are you encouraging them? Are you imparting the peace of God into their lives? Are you overwhelming them with the love of Jesus? Because the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is not just Father, Son, Holy Spirit. His name is life. His name is peace. His name is a rock that is not easily shaken. His name is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. His name is the stream of life. His name is grace. His name is love. His name is joy. Are we immersing them in the presence and in the name of our God. What does it mean to make disciples? It's more than just running through a program. I think, again, sometimes as a church, and I say capital C church, and maybe as a Singapore church, we're so meticulous, we're so, everything is in order, everything needs to have a curriculum. It's so easy for us to forget that discipleship is more than just a course, it's life. It's the way we live it's the way we interact. The greatest points of discipleship is not found in a course. The greatest points of discipleship is in the way that you respond in a time of crisis and whether people are there to actually see how you respond. I think one of the greatest moments of discipleship for the disciples is when they saw Jesus at Gethsemane for a couple of minutes before they fell asleep. I think the greatest discipleship moment they received was when he willingly followed the soldiers when he willingly died on the cross. Which speaks volumes because 10 of the remaining 11 died a death of suffering for the sake of the gospel. Why? Because when Jesus was here, he made disciples. How? By baptizing them. Notice this, nowhere in the scripture is it recorded that Jesus baptized his disciples in water. He baptized them with his presence. I tell you this, when I came to the revelation that this is what discipleship looks like, every moment in life, it's an opportunity to disciple the people around us. Every moment in life. The question is, are we discipling others? Can I just tell us one last thing before we shift to the next point? I want to do away with this fallacy. While discipleship is a gift that salvation brings us into, discipleship doesn't start at the point of salvation. It starts before. Everybody is being discipled. I'll give you an example. You look at little children. They always tend to mimic their parents. Why? Because whether the parents like it or not, whether they're intentional or not, they're discipling their children. And this gets me nowadays. Because every time people look at Josiah and say, man, he sounds like an old uncle. Oh, man, I only have to look at myself. Because you must have gotten it from somewhere, and I'm sure it wasn't Amanda. Why? Because it's, he's immersed in the old uncle. Right? I mean, it's, it's this place. And so don't miss out on the opportunities where you can disciple the people around you. We're all discipling somebody. The question is, how? in the ways of God, in the ways of the world, or according to the ways of our own flesh. And so number one, what does it look like to disciple? What does it mean to make disciples? It's to baptize people, not just within the practice of water baptism, which we will move into as a church in time to come, but also more importantly in the place of the immersion of our lives. Are we immersing them? Are we overwhelming them with the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, with the presence 
of God. But the second thing that we're called to do, the second reason why we're here, is not just to baptize people, but it's to teach them to observe all that God has commanded us. I love this. But what does it mean to teach them to observe all that God has commanded us? I want to break down two words for us in this phrase. The first word is to teach. The word teach in the original language means not just to teach head knowledge, but it's to impart, to explain, and to instill. Notice that in the descriptive words that they use to explain this word, only one speaks about head knowledge, to explain. To instill and to impart speaks about the heart. We are called to teach. We're called to explain, yes, but we're also called to impart and to instill. For what purpose? It's not just so that people will be more smart or more knowledgeable in the things of God, but so that they will observe all that God has commanded them. The word observe here in the original language, it means to attend to, it means to take care of, and it means to follow. So not just observe, it's like, yeah, I know, I see. It's not just to be an observer, but it's to be a doer. Again, this, is, this makes perfect sense because we're not just called to be hearers of the word, we're called to be doers of the word. You see, all of us are called to teach people to observe all that God has commanded us. And again, I think somewhere, sometimes as a church, we still fall short of this. Because in the same way that we relegate water baptism to just the pastors, oftentimes we relegate the teaching of the word to just the pastors. Or maybe the leaders. And again, this is something I want us to know. As a church, we'll be slowly moving away from that. Now, I promise you, it's not because I don't want to talk. I love preaching the word. But I believe that there is something important and significant and powerful that happens when the body of Christ gathers together to preach the word together. And so there will be days ahead where different ones will be here that may not be on the staff of the church, may not be pastors in the church, that will be given an opportunity to, to teach the Word of God, to preach the Word of God. Why? Because when we gather as a body, all of us bring a different perspective. All of us bring a different style of communication. All of us add to this beautiful canvas known as the gospel. And we become a better reflection of Christ in the body. And so if you ever get approached to share something, to teach, whether it's on the pulpit, whether it's in prayer meeting, whether it's in our Christian education class, I pray that you won't be so quick to, no, 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 that's not for me, that's for somebody else. Might I bring us back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Again, this call is for all, to make disciples of all nations, but this also presents us with a few challenges. Because most of us here, there'll be some things about what God has commanded us that we don't even know. We're not even sure about it. And I think this is why God called us to teach. I don't know, have any of you taught, had to teach something in your work or, or in, your, in your line or, or whatever it may be? you realize real quick that you don't know a lot of things. And so because you need to teach, you end up studying or you end up trying to figure out more things because you don't want to stand up there and look like a person who, like an idiot, lah, who doesn't know anything, right? You, you want to at least be worth your salt. In the same way, when we walk in the responsibility and the call of God to teach the people around us, it also keeps us in check because we want to be good stewards of the word and so we study it even more. You see, church, the thing I want us to catch today is that as a church, we're not called to be consumers of the gospel. We're called to make disciples with the gospel. And I think the question that we need to ask ourselves in relation to this point is are we teaching people to observe all God has commanded us? And for this, I want you to highlight the word all. Because once you highlight or underline that word, you recognize all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
even as a pastor, I can say, okay, I don't think I've taught y'all all all that God has commanded us. There's still a lot that we have to go through, that we have to unpack. Because maybe there are some things that we've taught here, but it's yet to be imparted or caught here in our hearts. The evidence of that is by the simple observation that we're not living in it. That we're not living it out in our lives. And I want you to just reflect. I want you to reflect on these two things straight off the bat. If we are called to make disciples of all nations, and if to make disciples means that we are to baptize them in the way that, in the way that we live and to teach It means it's not enough to just live a good life and to to comfort people around us and to speak the Word of God. No, we're to teach them, we're to explain it, we're to really go deep into it. Then the next question I want to just present to us is this. Are there times in your life where as you live this life where you feel empty, where you feel tired, where you feel weary, where you feel like you, you don't know why you're living, where you feel like everything is meaningless? If you're one of those people who say, no, I've never felt like that before, come and, come and find me because then you can teach me all that God has commanded us. Uh, because I'm sure all of us have gone through moments like that in our lives. My challenge for us this morning is when you find yourself stuck in those moments, make a commitment to God to start making disciples. Now, it's counterintuitive because the last thing you want to do when you're tired and you're drained and you don't know what to do with your life, the last thing you want to do is to go find somebody to impart into them and to teach them and to disciple them and to share the love of God with them. No, you want somebody to come and find you to share the love of God with you, right? Isn't that what we want to do? But my promise to you is this. If you start to make disciples, if you start walking in the call of God in your life in the moments where you don't feel like it, that's where you find purpose and that's where you find the rest of God upon your life. I can't tell you the number of times, even in the past three weeks or month, where I've just felt like staying at home and just doing nothing. And then I get a call or then something happens and and it's almost like every part of my being just wants to ask them to call Pastor Jay. I don't know, like, like that's the only other next person I can think of, right? And, or, or, or to call somebody else or, or find another time. And then yet I'm reminded of the call. I'm reminded of the reason why I'm here. And again, why I'm here not as a pastor, but why I'm here as a son of the Most High God. And I want us to hear this because I, I can hear it in your brain already. You're all quickly discrediting this to, yeah, of course you pastor. No, no, it's as a son of the Most High God. And I go, and I do different things. I can tell you every time I've done it, my body may still be tired, but my mind, my heart, and my spirit is refreshed. In fact, it is more refreshed than if I stayed at home and did nothing. Why? Because when you start to live in His why, His why will be the rest that you need to live it out. I can't convince you any other way. You just need to try it and put it to the test. Which brings us to the last question today. If this is what God is calling us to do, if this is the reason why He has placed us here on this earth, to make disciples, to baptize them, to to teach them, how do we go about doing this? How do we go about doing this? Again, the Scriptures say this. It says it at the very start, go. But go and do what? Go, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. So how do we do this? I just want to give us three very, very quick pointers as to how we can actually start making disciples. Because if you're not making a disciple, then you need to start looking at your life again and say, then why am I really here? Then what is the gift of the gospel? What is the grace of Jesus really for? It is to make disciples so that we can bring about transformation and the reconciliation of the world. Number one, go and be intentional. See, the word go already has intention. It wasn't, Jesus didn't say, wait and make disciples. He said, go therefore 
and make disciples. It's one of the reasons why Philip ended up going where he did. It's one of the reasons why Thomas ended up in India, what we now know as India, right? It's, it's, it's why they went to the nations. They didn't just wait for the nations to come. And again, this is something as Singaporeans we have to catch. Because I know we always say, well, like the Antioch of Asia, you know, why go on a mission trip when the nations have come to Singapore? Now, it's not an either or. It's always both and, right? We're not just to don't care about the people, the nations here, and then go to the nations. Neither are we to just care for the nations here and then forget about the nations out there. We're called to do both. We're called to be intentional. But it starts with the home. For parents, can you be intentional? to disciple your children in the ways of God. For those of you who are working, maybe don't go up a few levels so fast. Lah. Don't try and be intentional to disciple your boss. Although maybe the favour of God will be upon you when that happens. But be intentional to disciple those around you, those who have been put under your charge. You may not necessarily need to use scriptures. You may not necessarily need to use Christian terminology. It could be as simple as a short prayer. It could be as simple as buying them a meal, being a listening ear, be intentional, be purposeful. Don't leave it to chance. Think about who you can disciple. Think about who God has brought into your life that you can disciple. And set aside something to do to disciple them. But number two, be accessible. What do I mean by this? It means to be open and available. See, one of the greatest examples that we see in Jesus' life is that he made himself accessible to the 12. They followed him everywhere. He even made his home accessible. There's a scripture in the book of Mark where after he finishes the time of ministry, he goes home to rest and then people show up. And because people show up, he decides to preach. Again, it was most likely his off day, if he had one. And he, he decided to preach. And as a result of that preaching, there was no room in the house. And so four friends decided to break open his roof and bring people down. What does that speak about? It speaks about this gift of access. Make your life accessible. It's one of the reasons why I'm so happy to have a home now. My home is accessible. Anybody can come. You want to come? You call me. Uh, just, just let me know. Anytime. Obviously, if I'm at home. Right? But, but it's this place. Why? Because it's the gift of access. Don't be so quick to close the door. Don't be so quick to say, i got to go for something else. No. Be accessible. Be open and available. Because that's what Christ has done for us. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you needed Jesus and Jesus said, wait, hold up. I need to go attend to something first. I'll come to you later on. No. And in that same vein, we are called to be like Him. Be accessible. When you're at home with your kids, and you're doing the dishes, or you're doing some work, or you're watching TV. And your kid comes up to you. And maybe you had a really long day at work. Might I encourage you? Be accessible. When you're at work and you've got so many projects to clear. And your colleague is in need of prayer. Maybe they're going through a tough time. Or they're just overwhelmed with their own work. Will you be accessible? Because it's our accessibility that creates a bridge for them to then have access to the one who will never fail with them, Jesus. Number three, be accountable. See, the place of discipleship is the place of accountability. It's the place of following up with people. It's the place of not being afraid to speak into their lives. It's, it's the place of of not being afraid to ask them about what's going on. It's the place of accountability. And this is something I believe as a society we struggle with ever so greatly. 
Because in the world that we live in today, we live in a world of independence, where there's no need to be accountable to one another. But I want you to know that accountability is actually a gift that God has given to us because without accountability, it's easy to stumble and to fall and it's easy to be forgotten. Accountability is the thing that actually adds substance and weight to the things that we do. Be accountable. Whenever you feel like God is calling you to do something, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with somebody. When you feel like God wanting somebody else to do something or you feel like God has a word for somebody else, be accountable, share it with them. And be humble enough to admit that you missed it if it doesn't fit. See, if we can't do it here, how can we do it outside the four walls of the church? And if we can't do it on, outside the four walls of the church, how can people outside the four walls be blessed by the word that God has for them? It starts from the place of accountability. We have to be accountable. And that leads us to this question again, then how intentional, how accessible, and how accountable have you been to the people around you? Discipleship cuts both ways. How, how much access have you given to people to disciple your life? And how accountable have you been to them so that you can be a disciple? But in the same way, how accountable have you held people around you to the place of discipleship? And how much access have you given to them so that they can be discipled? And as I say this and as the worship team comes up to join me, I, I know because what is discipleship? The reason why we're here is to make disciples. To make disciples means that we are to baptize them, not just in the waters, but with our lives and in this journey of life. That's why discipleship is life on life. But it's also in the place of teaching them the ways of God. That means we have to learn it and we have to know it for ourselves. It means that we have to be intentional, accessible, and accountable. And I tell you what, you hear all of these things and it can sound baptismal, right? It can sound overwhelming. It is like, man, God, I feel like without this, I've already got too many things on my plate and I don't know if I can even do this. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I, I know that many of us may think that. I think that at times. Man, a life of making disciples is not an easy life. And I want you to know that it's entirely true. In fact, making disciples is an impossible task only made possible with God's presence and power. And Jesus himself knew this. And that's the beauty of the Great Commission. Because it's an impossible commission, but given with the promise of his power and his presence, which makes it possible. Let me read it to you again. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It speaks of the power of God. And so therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. His presence. I don't think he was just saying that for the sake of making it sound nice. I think Jesus understood that if you, in order for you to live out this call, you need to start with his power and you need to be covered with his presence. Because if not, it will be an impossible task to accomplish. Why are we here, church? I believe with all my heart that as a church, we are here to make disciples of all nations. And I know that there'll be times in your life where you don't feel like it. There'll be times in your life where you feel, you feel inadequate to do it because who am I? I I've not even gotten my life together. But wherever you may be on that spectrum, I want you to know that when it comes to God, 
His call never changes. He has deemed you worthy to make disciples of all nations. Church, God wants us to be a disciple-making church. I've been reflecting on this for the last two to three months. And and I think as a church, we've come a long way. I think God's doing great and mighty things. He's given us a vision. He's given us a mission. But in the last two to three months, I've been really, I've become really dissatisfied with church. I've been asking God, there has to be more to church. There has to be more to just coming and, and giving a word and then leaving. There has to be more to, to just prayer meetings on a Wednesday. There has to be more than, than just live groups every week. And God, there has to be more to the way that we do church. And as much as I've been reflecting on this, I've always just come back to this one truth. There is more. And what that more looks like is to be a disciple-making church. What that more looks like is that it's not just you who's making disciples. It's all who are making disciples. And I pray that as we present this time to the Lord that God will just begin to stir up that dissatisfaction within our hearts because God there has to be more to life than what we're doing God we want to make disciples show us what it looks like God God I'm I'm, I'm fearful of how much access I have to give to people because because I want them to see the good not the bad and the ugly but God if to make disciples means to invite them even into the ugly so that they can see your grace. God, help me to grow in this place of access. For others, maybe you're here and you just don't like the word accountability. Just the word accountability flips a switch in you and it's not a good switch. Maybe you've been hurt by the church in the past or Maybe the word accountability has been used in a way that it shouldn't have been used. Maybe it was abused even in that season. Can I exhort you to surrender that to God and to allow God to renew your perspective of accountability? It's a gift that He has given to you. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, wherever you are, will you just begin to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? And Jesus, we come before you this morning and, and God, we hear the call that you've given to us as a church. Every Christian, God, we are here to make disciples of all nations. We're here to baptize them, not just in the waters, but but with our presence and with our lives. We're here to baptize them in your name. And we're here to teach them to observe all that you have commanded. God, I pray that even in this moment that your spirit will come and reveal to us the areas in this call in which we've fallen short. But instead of condemnation, God, I pray for the uplifting of your presence. Because it's only by your grace that we're able to do the commission that you've given to us. God, I pray that even in this moment that you will begin to drop the faces and the names of specific individuals in the hearts of your people today that they will come to the revelation that these are the ones that you are calling them to disciple. You will help them to step out in faith to do it. And so Father, we thank you for this time that we have. Lord, even as we respond to you in the next few moments, 
God, let your spirit come and let it fill our hearts. Because we don't want to live out this call from a place of a task. But we want to walk in this call built on the foundation of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All across this place, will you just stand? As the worship team begins to lead us in a song of response, I just want to open up the altars for those of you who maybe feel like you want to make this commitment before God to say, God, I want to make disciples. Maybe some of you here, you just want to come before God and to ask for His forgiveness of the times in which you've neglected this call. But I also want to open up these altars for those of you who maybe have a prayer need or or a certain situation where you just need someone to come alongside you to pray. And so again, if you fall under the last category where it's a need, maybe it's not related to the message at all, then I just want to invite you to just come to the front here, on, right in front of the board. And then for the rest of you, if, if you feel led to just respond and come to the altar, to make this a place of a commitment before God, then you can just come to the rest of the altar. But as a church, I pray that this is something that will be stirred within our hearts because it is the word of the Lord. And so come on, wherever you are, will you just begin to respond to him? It's the worship team leads us. Oh, hallelujah.